Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to see uh, this big crowd here on a Friday afternoon. I am Nick Burns, director of the Aspen Strategy Group. I want to welcome you here. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about the book that you all have been given. You don't have to buy it. We're not going to charge you in the way out. Yeah, but Walter's going to autograph we, it. We would, Walter will autograph every yeah. copy on the way out. Um, this is a book produced by uh, the Aspen Strategy Group. We are a nonpartisan group. We've been in existence for 32 years. Our ethic is that we ought to be able to have civil conversations, rational conversations about American foreign policy and national security issues. And so we are resolutely nonpartisan. Condoleezza Rice is a member. Mad uh, Madeleine Albright is a member. Republicans, Democrats, Independents. This group was created by two people, by General Brent Scowcroft, who's with us today, and um, Professor Joe Nye of Harvard University, my colleague at Harvard, Joe Nye, back in 1984, at the height of the Cold War, to look at arms control issues between the United States and Soviet Union. Uh, Bill Perry, who later became Secretary of Defense, Senator Sam Nunn, were also early founders of this group. And I wanted to salute General Scowcroft, who is with us today, <laughs> seated in the front row, the only American who has been National Security Advisor twice, uh, the one who I think all of us believe was the most successful at it and set the template for how to be an effective uh, National Security Advisor. I had the great privilege to work for him when he was National Security Advisor for President George H.W. Bush. So please join me in welcoming <laughs> General Brent Scowcroft. Thank you. Thank you. We conduct, as a group, uh, dialogues uh, with the Indian leadership. In fact, we're meeting starting tonight with a group of 20 Indian national security figures with the Chinese Communist Party leadership in a separate dialogue, and now a new dialogue with Brazil. Every summer in beautiful Aspen, Colorado, we get together, 50 to 60 of us, uh, to talk about one big issue. This past summer, we talked about what we're calling blind spot, America's policies uh, trying to confront radical terrorism in the Middle East. We spent four days thinking about the historic roots um, of um, Radicalism in Muslim history. Bernard Heichel, professor at Princeton, led us through that discussion. We thought about uh, the history of America's interaction, both with Mos Muslims around the world, but also with the states of the Middle East since the Second World War. We talked about what has happened to the Middle East <coughs> five years ago next month, the Arab revolutions, the Arab <coughs> uprisings, what some people call the Arab Spring developed. I think five years later, among the 22 Arab states, you'd be hard pressed to find more than two or three that are better off. Maybe Tunisia, maybe Morocco, but Egypt, which has had revolution, counter-revolution, return to authoritarianism, still has strife. Four states have ceased to be nation states. Libya, torn apart by a civil war. Yemen, victim of a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Syria, of course, it's 12 million homeless and a population of 22 million people. Iraq divided into three parts. So you truly have a Middle Eastern crisis. And now in the last few months, we've seen in a succession of terror attacks in Ankara, in Paris, the presumably Islamic State-inspired terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. Uh, this challenge is a global challenge, not just a regional challenge. And so we are... Producing, we have produced this book, which you all have, which will go on sale at Amazon uh, today, which is a collection of the 17 papers that were written about the history of our relations with the Muslim world, about the politics of the Arab revolutions, and about key policy questions that I'm now going to pose to our three guests who are all at this meeting. And so I want to welcome General Jim Cartwright, 40-year veteran of the United States Marine Corps, Commander of Strategic Command, and in his final position, at least at this point in his government career, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, someone who's thought and helped us this past summer to think very deeply, do we have military options here, short of an Iraq 2003 scenario that would help us to defeat the Islamic State? I want to thank General Cartwright for being here. We have Cong former member of Congress, Jane Harmon, who is now Director, President, and Chief Executive Officer of the Woodrow Wilson a foundation here in Washington, D.C. Did I say foundation? That's the wrong word. It's center. Center. Thank you, Jane. 
Jane, uh, as a member of Congress, deeply involved in national security issues, deeply involved in intelligence issues, has been very frequently to the Middle East over many years, and is a real expert on these issues. And finally, Richard Fontaine, who is president of the Center for a New American Security, um, I think one of the fastest rising think tanks in Washington, and directs that organization with his colleague, Michelle Flournoy. Michelle and Richard have been writing Republican and Democrat together about all these issues. How do we respond politically, diplomatically, militarily to extremism, radicalism, terrorism, jihadi terrorism, Islamic terrorism, whatever you choose to call it, that is afflicting the Middle East and now confronting the United States? What we'll do here, I'm going to pose a series of questions one by one to each of my colleagues, and then we'll open it up maybe about 35 minutes from now to all of you. So get your questions ready and your comments. We'll bring this to a conclusion at about 1.15 because um, one of our members has to depart at that point, but I thank you all. Um, uh, the first question I want to pose is to Congresswoman Harmon. Um, and the question is that in the, pr in the debate right now in the country, particularly <laughs> since Paris, Jane, and San Bernardino, at least most of the Republican candidates have been saying, we are at war. Are we at war? And if we are at war, ought not the Congress to vote an authorization for the use of military force to enable the administration to prosecute a military campaign? Uh, thank you, Nick. First of all, if anyone has a cough drop, I would really appreciate it before I embarrass myself. Thank you. I knew it would be a woman. Um, I always love being here. As much as I tease Walter, I am a trustee at the Aspen Institute, and uh, I have been a member of this group since the mid, thank you, thank you, Haas, uh, since the mid-90s when Sam Nunn invited me to speak to it on my way home from beautiful downtown Pyongyang, North Korea. And then he suggested that I join, and it is a fabulous group. And Walter is right that there is uh, no partisanship. It's uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, teamwork answering the hardest questions and the heart and soul of the group is Brent Scowcroft. That's right. And so I want to confess my undying love in <laughs> front of all of you for Brent Scowcroft. <laughs> Cutest man on the planet. Okay, now, said that. Oh, come on. Oh, uh, <laughs> well he is. If any of you thinks you're cuter, raise your hand. <laughs> See, one in a landslide. I knew it would happen. All right, so this question about are we at war? Yes, we are at war. Um, we are dropping bombs, using drones, using special ops uh, forces, and killing people in uh, uh, Iraq and Syria and um, other places. Uh, yes, we are at war. Uh, should Congress be involved? Damn right. Uh, I was in Congress um, back in the day, in 2001, when we voted for the uh, Afghanistan AUMF shortly after we were attacked. The vote was uh, 534 to 1. Uh, Barbara Lee, a uh, conscientious member of Congress from Berkeley, California, thought we shouldn't be doing this and voted no. And I applauded her uh, for, for voting her conscience. It is a good thing to do. Uh, but at any rate, um, as we authorized force against those who attacked us on 9-11 in Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, um, or based in Afghanistan, uh, uh, nobody who voted for that thought it would still be in effect, this 2001 AUMF, 14 years later, and apply to uh, activities, kinetic actions, elsewhere in the Middle East. Nobody. And yet this tired old thing is being dragged out as the basis, the legal basis for our action uh, now against ISIL, other groups, Al-Qaeda, all over the Middle East. And uh, I think it is past time, is this latest action has been going on for over a year, for Congress to pass an AU, a new AUMF. Authorization for the use of military force. Right, and repeal the old one. And oh, by the way, if I were doing it, I would consider including uh, Iran among the list of actions we are authorizing. Uh, not this minute, this is an authorization. This isn't, this isn't telling the president to do something this minute, but. If, if you agree with me that an, an option, if Iran cheats on the nuclear deal and the snapback doesn't work, is military force, why don't we just do it now? Authorize the president or the future president, whoever she may be, to use force. 
if, uh, well, there's a woman running in the Republican Party, too. I don't know what your problem is. Uh, if uh, there's, so, um, what I think we should do, and a number of members of Congress have called for this, and the President himself in his Sunday night uh, address, this, you know, a few days ago, said Congress should enact an AOMF, is uh, call Congress back in early January, that is if the government is still open, hopefully it will be, and have a debate on the floor of the House. Both chambers could do this together. Imagine that, adult behavior, uh, on a series of issues surrounding an AOMF. The president should probably update the one he sent uh, some, some months back that was dead on arrival uh, to address new circumstances. And then Congress ought to consider it. And why should it do this now? Well, one, we're at war, but number two, this is the way to bring in the public for a healthy discussion, not the kind of crazy discussion we're having responding to Donald Trump. This could be the real discussion uh, where people could address all the tough issues through Congress. So Jane, quick follow-up uh, to what you've just said. I certainly agree that the President's right. Congress should take responsibility mm -hmm. and authorize the use of military force. But if you bring Iran into it, which is a very different issue than combating the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, rebuilding the Iraqi army, et cetera, doesn't that make it even more difficult to get Congress to act? I actually think it would make it easier. Uh, I'm not sure. I agree it's apples and oranges to some extent. But number one, it'll be hard, hard enough to get anything to happen. Um, I'm, I'm quite realistic about this. But number two, uh, Iran is the place Congress would actually like to, do, like to act. Uh, I think there's a, not, if not unanimity, at least very strong opinion. That was a hugely controversial agreement. Um, that we want to make sure Iran doesn't cheat. So if Congress is, is considering that, I, I, I am not arguing that these are the identical issue, right. but I'm just saying put on a list of things for the Middle East this issue. Good. Uh, by the way, I should explain something about the book we gave you that we're publishing today. It is not a consensus document that was worked out among uh, 60 people at our meeting, Republicans and Democrats, last August. It's a collection of 17 papers written by 17 indi individuals that ranges from the historical, Bernard Heichel of Princeton, to very practical issues having to do with what should we be doing politically and militarily. Uh, and I want to get to Richard Fontaine and ask him about one of those practical issues. One of the issues we debated last August, and that is very pertinent now, is what is our strategic aim? Uh, the administration's language for the past year and a half since we began conducting air operations against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has been defeat the Islamic State. But if you look at the policy, I think it's been a contained policy. We don't have the forces in place to defeat them. So it's actually a contained policy. In the wake of Paris, President Hollande, even President Putin, and now President Obama Sunday night have been saying we need to defeat them. Richard. Do we have a defeat strategy? Is defeat the right strategic objective? And do we have the forces in place, the right policy to achieve that objective? Yeah, thanks, Nick, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute uh, with so many others to this volume. I think the, uh, as you said, the stated uh, objective of U.S. policy now is to defeat and to destroy ISIS. I do not think that we have a policy that is going to bring that about uh, any time uh, in the foreseeable future. I think the policy, uh, despite its verbal description, uh, is one of containment. And even on that score, it seems to be failing. Uh, the intelligence community and the uh, military has uh, said as recently as this week that ISIS is, in fact, not contained. Um, I think the, the problem with containment is uh, one that is very different from containing other kinds of threats that the United States has faced in the past, the Soviet threat, so, and so on. Even if you geographically contain ISIS to an area in uh, Iraq or Syria, for example, and sort of let it stay there, uh, push it back and just keep it there, uh, because of social media, because of technology, because of the ability to inspire and to plan, uh, it can generate attacks outside the area in which it's located. That, of course, is the thing we care about most, which are attacks in our country and in those of our allies. And so. You know, all of the humanitarian and other um, considerations aside, if you aim merely for <coughs> containment, you're, you, it's a recipe, first, probably for endless bloodshed within the area that's being contained, but secondly, for continuing attacks outside the area that's contained. So I think defeat is the ultimate uh, strategic objective. Now, 
That's a difficult objective. Uh, we have not defeated and destroyed Al Qaeda despite 14 years uh, and uh, counting of effort uh, against them. Um, but I do think that uh, between where the policy is now and the thing that no one wants to do, which is, or almost no one wants to do, which is a reinvasion of Syria, uh, uh, or an invasion of Syria, a reinvasion of Iraq, uh, massive numbers of American troops on the ground that are trying to. Uh, take and hold territory, uh, there are a series of things that the United States and its partners could do to intensify uh, the fight against ISIS uh, that would aim more directly at the defeat objective. So Richard, my follow-up question to you, and then I'm going to ask General Cartwright about the military options, would be um, whether we're prioritizing right. If you look at the 260,000 dead in the Syrian civil war and the 12 million homeless, these numbers are huge, the vast majority of the dead and homeless have been caused by President Assad and his country's, <coughs> his air force's barrel bombing of Aleppo and, uh, and Homs and other Syrian cities. <coughs> if we go after the Islamic State first, uh, are we going after the real problem, at least for the Syrian people and the Iraqi people? Yeah, I think you have to go after, uh, you have to take on Assad and the Islamic State at the same time. I think if you, if, if you look at the four countries that in the Middle East that are engulfed in civil war right now, Yemen, Iraq, Libya, and Syria, it is no coincidence that all of them host either ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or both. These groups breed in civil wars. They are uh, able to establish sanctuary in civil wars, and then they start to generate international attacks beyond their sanctuary. In addition to that, ISIS has framed itself as the protector of Sunni Muslims in a country that is uh, under siege by an apostate Alawite regime in Damascus. So long as that narrative and that condition of civil war continues, which it will continue as long as Assad is in power, uh, then you're going to have the underlying forces. And I think you've seen this, you know, the, the Pentagon says as recently, uh, again, as this week, that, you know, the body count is above 20,000 uh, ISIS fighters, but they've been replaced at a one-for-one -one rate uh, over the year and a half that we've conducted our bombing campaigns. Uh, so as long as these underlying political forces are fueling ISIS, one of those forces is Assad's continued rule, you're going to have this problem indefinitely. Thank you. I want to turn to General Cartwright, who of course has uh, a lot, 40 years of experience thinking through um, the application of military power to problems like this. This seems an impossible problem. And we discussed, Jim, this summer, but also just in the wake of the Paris attacks. What more could the United States and its 65-nation coalition do to take the fight to the Islamic State and or the Syrian forces and at some point to be able to allow diplomacy some space to end the war? And you and I were just talking before this session. Um, does creation of safe havens, protected zones where refugees can go, is that a sensible next step? And of course, to protect a safe haven, you'd have to uh, cover that with a no-flight zone. Does more substantial arming of some of the Sunni rebel groups fighting Assad and the Islamic State and the Syrian Kurdish groups make sense to you? As a military person, what would you advise the president now? Um, and I only have five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Take but, six or you seven. Know, and, and, you know, in, in the summertime when we have these debates with each other, Nick and, and, and the general ask us questions. Nobody listens to the questions. They just talk about what they want to answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we know so, that. <laughs> so, you know, um, take this with a grain of salt. Um, there is a bit of a challenge in the vocabulary that we're using. And, and we ran into this this summer. Um, if I say contain in the strategic sense, that has a very different meaning than in the military sense. And, and much of the discussion that we had this summer was degrade and defeat, okay, that, that's the strategy that's been articulated. My concern was that the reality of that is you cannot do degrade and defeat without contain in a military sense. So you don't want what's going on in Syria to continually flow into Iraq or any other country and vice versa or into Turkey, et cetera. So you are, in fact, you have to, as a beginning military strategy, to isolate the battlefield. That, that's, that's just kind of core to your understanding of how to maneuver in it. Um, so, so the contained piece in the military sense is an absolutely essential part of what we're doing. It does not mean that this won't spill out someplace, it won't appear in different senses. That's one. The second issue that um, I think is very important to understand, at least from a military sense, you know, is this idea of defeat. Um, 
if you're talking about ISIS, ISIS is a symptom. It is not the disease. Defeat of ISIS does not end this. Defeat of Al Qaeda did not end this and won't. Okay. What, is the, what are the underlying conditions that must be satisfied in order to get there? And then does the military strategy move you in a direction that advantages that opportunity? So when you think about strategy, I mean, you can come up with all sorts of ways to bomb a target. But what is it that actually enables the opportunity, not necessarily the solution, but the opportunity for a solution in a, in a reasonable process? And those solutions, uh, when you look at groups, whatever country, whatever fight that you want to go back through history, you know, early on, the extremist part of the activity is what is the face of the conflict. Okay. It almost never, in fact, I can't find an instance in history where that part is actually the end part or the solution. Okay. Um, going back is not a solution to today's problems or the future's problems. Being informed by history is. So I, I just put that context for you. So when you start to think about a military activity associated with this and, and going beyond where we are today, how would you start to think about it? Because what we're doing today is actually starting to get um, some efficiency in the military side of the equation as intelligence becomes more robust, as we have people out there looking for targets, understanding what's going on in the ground, and then assessing it and, and deciding, okay, we should take action in this area or that action. Thinking about where we want to go to start to, to do this, one of the key issues that that really is in their ballpark, but, but you get forced with, is this issue of the, of the immigration uh, activity that's going on out there that's just all of these people fleeing the, the conflict. Okay? How do we start to get that under control? How do we set the conditions that when we, when we have people who are trying to legitimately free, flee from the, the fight, give them a place to go okay, from which they can start to think about what the alternative is and what the solution is going to look like. Okay. And so safe zones is the next logical step, okay. at least from a military perspective. Start to create places on the ground where people can go in reasonable safety. Do not, do not make them look like a prison camp. Do not make them look like the United States. They must look like the future that Syria wants for itself. Those camps should not have one element of Syrian belief, religion, organizations. They should be integrated so that they all get to talk and think this through under the same conditions. Those camps need to look like that, those areas, these safe zones. And they should be reasonably free of, of all of the activity that's going around. Is a no-fly zone part of this? Is it more boots on the ground, et cetera? That's for the coalition to decide and to work their way through. If I ask, in the tactical sense, if I ask a pilot what a no-fly zone should look like, I will get one answer. If I ask a missileer what it should look like, I'll get a different answer. And if I ask a soldier you know, on the ground, I'll get, so what is it we need to do. Does it need to be safe? That, the sky in Syria is more dense than the sky over New York right now with airplanes. Okay? I mean, it's just incredibly crowded. Okay? So starting to think about zones in which we will protect, zones in which there are areas of responsibility and we will do those types of things, whether they're covered with airplanes, which actually is a very, very expensive way to go and terribly inefficient to boot, um, there are far more efficient ways to run a no-fly zone, and that's another five minutes. But it's, it's a start to get us to think about where do we want to go with this. Those safe zones <laughs> must represent the approach to the cure, not the defeat of the symptom. Okay, that, 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 I'll leave it at that. So, General, let me ask you a follow-up question, and, and you're all going to get a chance to ask our th my three colleagues your own questions. Um, <coughs> What we're hearing from the administration in the public debate is that this is too hard. No flight zone, safe zone. We're not going to get everybody to agree. Um, is it too hard from a military point of view? And politically, 
wouldn't actually this be to the advantage of Turkey and Russia, if you think about it, to have these safe zones to try to give diplomacy a greater space? At least it challenges the Russians if we look at it that way. How do you, how do you see that? I think it is time for the, all of the players to start to think about the safe zones, okay, <coughs> to, to look at what is it that in, in any one group's mind, any one country's mind, is the next step to get there. We're becoming far more efficient on the ground. We have far more forces involved, we being the, the large. Um, there is still, particularly in Syria, a, a very unstable as to who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, who's doing what, what are their aims. That's not going to go away anytime soon. So what is the step that you're looking for, the trigger that you're looking for to start to move in the direction? It is not going to be uniform. So you're going to look for an area inside of Syria where this makes sense and where the people on the ground see value and see opportunity and believe that it will be sustained okay, and that they will be safe there. And it's up to the, the coalition to then go in and create that opportunity and then hold that opportunity. It could be boots on the ground. It's going to be some con con combination of things, but it cannot happen on the basis of just one country deciding they're going to do it. Could we militarily go in and clear in a zone? Yeah, we could. But that's not the way you want to do it. You want to do it in a way that makes sense to the Syrian people and, 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 and makes sense to the geographic location and the threat in that particular regional area. And coming to a consensus on that, I think, is very important. The, the difficulty here is, you know, if we just let this go the way it is, you have by de facto segregated and, and bifurcated all of Syria. You're going to split it up into pieces and factions and let it you know, go at that point. You want to find a, a cure. You want to find a way away from that, that de facto default position. And you're going to have to work with, with the entire coalition and the people on the ground in order to get there. So my sense is we're still six months to a year from having the conditions on the ground that will actually see one, see a safe area built and, 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 and go happen. The time to work to that and the condition setting is what's going to happen over the next six months. It has to. Thank you. And Jane, I want to get your expertise on this issue and I want to ask you to, I want to broaden it a bit. Um, of the 12 million Syrian homeless, and this is the greatest refugee uh, problem in the world today, uh, at least 5 million are out of the country. They're in refugee camps in Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, and Turkey. And now a mass of people moving into Europe on a perilous journey. In every refugee crisis for 60 years, in Republican or Democratic administrations, the United States has always led, except this one. Right. President Obama says we'll take 10,000. Most of the opposition, his opposition, says no refugees. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said he'll take in 25,000. President mm -hmm. Hollande said they'll take in 20,000 after the Paris attacks. We've taken in 1,548 refugees in the last two years from Syria. When Hillary Clinton believes we should be taking 65,000, which would be about what we should for historical averages, do we have a humanitarian, moral, and strategic interest in taking in Syrian refugees? Yes. And part of the problem, uh, not all of the problem, is our failure to act earlier to uh, control things better in Syria. Uh, I think these no-fly zones, safe zones, not, not a military uh, effort, but a humanitarian effort, should have been set up a long time ago. And our current military, Haas doesn't work there anymore, was saying how hard it is. In fact, there, a lot of them are still saying how hard it is. Uh, and if we had done that, we would have curbed this, this flow. Can we bring them here safely? Yes. Do we have procedures uh, to vet them? Yes. To understand this a little better, uh, you have to know that they don't come tomorrow morning on a, on a, a boat for, you know, bound for New York Harbor. There are layers of interviews in order to qualify for our asylum program, and it takes much longer than it should. It takes uh, a year, 18 months to two years to get these people here. So that's plenty of time 
to uh, improve our processes. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, P.S., we ought to do a little better with the fiancé visa program, too. Yeah. Thought I'd put that and out And there's there. a bill before Congress to <laughs> but tighten we that ought to, we, yes. we, we can do this. Uh, and and we, I think there's a moral obligation. I just say, wanted to say one thing about um, what House said about Russia. I'm much more dubious about Russia. I don't think Russia and we share the same uh, objectives in the region, and I also think that we should not, under any circumstances, forgive Russia for stealing Crimea and for continuing to destabilize Ukraine. Um, I think Russia will not sign on, my view, uh, and Haas, you're a lot smarter than I am about this, they will not sign on to this safe zone idea, but we can dare them by doing it into blocking it. Uh, right. they, will, they will not block it. They can't block it. You know, all of the objectives that Putin has in the region would be undone if he blocks it. So I certainly wouldn't ask his permission or even include him. I'd just go ahead and do it. Thank you. I, I want to, please. I don't disagree, but I would, in fact, give them the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Because yeah. at the end of the day, they have to be part of the conversation. And, and, and then work your way forward. And I think in the end, the, the success of it, the idea, the thought process will, in fact, win out. You know, over, well, Haas over. is nicer than I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but it might be strategically the best way to approach the Russians. Give them an up. They'll have to be the ones, as you said, Jane, to turn it down yeah. first. Yeah. Richard, I want to bring you in on um, a larger question. The president last Sunday night talked about the fact that the United States has assembled a 65-nation coalition to fight the Islamic State. <laughs> and yet, with respect, with all due respect, the United States is conducting 92 or 3 percent of the airstrikes. Britain and France, uh, Britain and Germany just came into the fight last week, but in a very symbolic way, not in a meaningful way. The Emiratis, Kuwaitis, and Saudis are AWOL. They're no longer fighting the Islamic State. They're fighting the civil war in Yemen. Uh, it seems to be all on our shoulders. How would you advise the president to get a true coalition, the type of coalition General Scowcroft, Secretary Baker established in 1991, to defeat Saddam Hussein in Kuwait was a true coalition where you actually had armies in the field from the Arab countries. We don't have anything like that against the Islamic State. Yeah, I think part of the challenge right now when it comes to the partners and the allies in the region is that for us, ISIS is the top priority and dealing with ISIS is the top priority. That is not the case for most of the other countries in the region. So Turkey's worried about ISIS, but it's worried more about the Kurdish problem. Uh, the Saudis and the other members of the G Gulf Cooperation Council are worried about ISIS, but they're worried more about Iranian influence and about being successful in their war against the Houthis in uh, Yemen. And you see this, if you look at the number of, uh, of air missions that the GCC countries uh, have flown over Syria in the past three months or so, it's dropped off really dramatically. They're redeploying all their military assets and attention to try to deal with the situation in Yemen, which itself doesn't seem to be going very well. Um, I think part of this is to, uh, is actually picks up on some of the things we were talking about, to try to realign uh, our interests uh, with some of uh, at least the GCC countries and with Turkey. So um, right now we have made rather plain that our objective is to defeat ISIS and that we'll deal with the Assad uh, issue either diplomatically or over the longer run uh, and so forth. The bigger issue, f again, for the GCC in Syria is Assad and the Iranian influence they think that uh, is, he provides a vector for. And so if we had a sound concept of how we might be able to bring the civil war uh, in Syria to a reasonable end uh, that dealt both with ISIS and with Assad, you may have greater buy-in from the GCC countries. Similarly, uh, with Turkey, uh, the establishment of safe zone on the Turkish border that would help uh, reduce the, the refugee flow across the border into Turkey uh, may get greater Turkish buy-in, uh, at least when it comes to things like border control and things like that. Could right. I just add something Please. to that? Uh, yeah. uh, in the paper today is news of a meeting yesterday in Saudi Arabia, right. Riyadh, uh, where uh, the opposition, the Syrian opposition, you know, question, is there a Syrian opposition? <coughs> Not really, but anyway, numbers of folks came together and tried to build a coalition, or said they had, of 30 people-ish who could go to Vienna or wherever these talks are now being held and participate in the talks to resolve Syria diplomatically. And 
uh, that's very good news. And John Kerry said that that was very good news because I, I strongly agree we have to have, in order to get their buy-in, I mean, the process has to lead to <coughs> Assad leaving. And so they have to be represented because that is what they are most concerned with. Right. I do think, though, we have to be realistic about what uh, other countries, however interested they are in achieving the objectives that we have, are willing to uh, are willing to put into the fight. I mean, um, if you look back at every coalition uh, effort, uh, the United States always plays a very disproportionate role in those operations, and we always right. sort of express disappointment with the inability or the unwillingness of our partners to do as much as we would like them to do. Uh, and now we would like to see, you know, the. The, the GCC come up with a, or and Jordan or Turkey come up with a Sunni ground force that would go in in large numbers to establish safe zones and push ISIS out of areas. And I think a lot of that is quite uh, unrealistic. So uh, we have to be realistic about what they are willing to do. I think that they would be willing to do more, um, but not to, you know, the great ap appetite that we might have for them. Thank you. Before we get to our last question, I just wanted to thank Jane for raising diplomacy because in the midst of all this talk about what should we do militarily, Secretary Kerry is working very hard to create a, a diplomatic track here that would end the war eventually. And there's every reason to believe that this war at some point is going to burn out and it'll end in a place like Vienna or Geneva. It may take years to get there, but it will end the way it will end the way the Bosnia War ended 20 years ago this past November. It will definitely end the way the Vietnam War ended in Paris in 1973. It'll end. So the question is, who needs to be at the table? And, and the U.S. is talking to Iran, <coughs> talking to Russia, and talking to the Turks at that right. table. But I think that the diplomacy may actually intensify the fighting because the people are going to be looking at that diplomatic endgame and they'll want to have more territory. They'll want to have more leverage. So there's an uneasy balance between the diplomacy and the fighting. Jane, last question. Donald Trump, not in an offhand comment, but in a written statement, said that we should keep Muslims out of the United States of America, our immigrant nation, our multi-religious nation. Now, how do you react to that as someone who served in the House of Representatives and represented an important district in California? And how do you react to it? How, do, how are Muslims around the world? looking at us right. based on that comment. Well, I, I agree with Arianna Huffington that it's time to stop talking about Donald Trump. Uh, if, if he is sucking up all the oxygen, we can't have a, uh, an adult conversation about a very serious issue. I mean, people are worried about refugees coming. We just talked about that. I think it's our moral obligation to take them. Uh, many of them will be Muslim, not all of them, uh, but the point is to vet them adequately. I think what Trump is saying is completely reckless, and he has this unerring instinct of how to get himself all the free media. So I'm not going to talk about him. I do want to talk, however, about the casualties of him, uh, including Muslims in our military who are serving now. There's a cover story in one of the papers about how they feel marginalized. Muslims throughout American society. We have done a good job of assimilating them, not perfectly. We haven't done a good job of assimilating anybody perfectly. Uh, but uh, very productive members of U.S. society uh, are Muslim, and it's a growing uh, uh, religion in this country. And we also have to think about force protection for our troops in the field. Uh, let's understand that. Um, again, some of whom are Muslim. So I, I, uh, I, I think the, the issues around this, I'm not talking about DT, the issues around um, hostility to Muslims are, are very dangerous. And, and one last comment. There are two Muslim members of Congress now, um, there certainly could be or maybe more in the future, who are thoughtful, careful people. In one case, anyway, Keith Ellison, uh, he's a convert. I don't know about Andre Carson, whether he's a convert or if he was born a Muslim. Um, but everyone in Congress learns from these people. So. It's about the dumbest and lamest idea by somebody I'm not talking about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, Jim? 
<laughs> I'm not going to follow that one. <laughs> well, sure, why not? Uh, the only thing I'll say about the, I, the gentleman who is to be unnamed, I suppose, is... Uh, he shall not be named. It is, it, it's not just how bad things might be were he to become commander-in-chief. He's actively undermining our national security right now through yeah. this kind of rhetoric at a time when the United States <laughs> is... Uh, trying to demonstrate to the world that uh, it is not the enemy of Islam. Uh, this is completely counterproductive and only makes uh, the, the situation and the task uh, so much harder. And I think, uh, as we have seen, uh, not just in the United States but in democracies around the world, if you have a demagogue who is willing to press emotional buttons, you can get a response from some proportion of your uh, population, and that's what uh, I'm afraid is happening right now. Thanks to all of you. Um, if you look at this book, um, there are issues discussed that we're not covering today. So Jared Cohen, who's at Google, came and spoke to us about the impact that social media is having yeah. in communicating the message of radicalism and enabling uh, radical groups to form. Farah Pandit who is a Muslim, who, is, who worked for both the Bush and Obama administrations as our outreach to the Muslim world, talked about how can we perceive the roots of radicalism in the Muslim world and how can we get at it to try to convince young people not to join the terrorist faith. And I mentioned Bernard Heichel, but I wanted to mention him again, Princeton historian yeah. of the Muslim world, who gave us a pan-centuries view <coughs> of the tradition, a tradition, it's only a minority tradition of radicalism. So I encourage you uh, to read the book. And now we're very happy to go to your questions, uh, comments about any aspect of this issue. Please, and if you could just give us your name. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Tara McKelvey. I'm the White House reporter for the EU. Um, and I have a question about countering um, ideology. That's not on the mic. If you hold it very close, I think it, it, it I think we'll, we'll hear it. Um, well, I mean, can I just speak about the mic? No. We've, we're taping it. <laughs> We're taping it so for TV, so we're going to get you another mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the question about ideology, there's lots of theories about how to fight um, extremist ideology. Um, the White House people are always talking to me about um, economic development and about, you know, if these jihadists <coughs> could become small business people, maybe it would fix the problem. So I'm wondering if you can tell me what your, you know, what you think is the best way to counter ideology is and the research that you've done or the reading that you've done. Well, uh, I just would say I, I was very impressed by the uh, Bernard Heichel who spoke to us and uh, gave the Ernie May lecture at the beginning of the strategy group meeting. Uh, Ernest May, for those who unfortunately have never heard of him, was the vaunted professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard for many years and really extraordinarily wise man who died a few years ago. But Heichel made a point that this is a serious challenge to Islam. And it is a form of Islam, a perverted, you know, cherry-picked, grotesque form. But the, there have been strains of Islam over centuries. Uh, if you read his, you, read, you can read everybody else's brilliant articles. I don't have one in the book, so you don't have to read mine. But um, read his first, and it is first. And, and he says, you have to call this, I'm, I'm not trying to wade into the political minefields, but this is what he said, and it was compelling. You have to call this Islamic. Extremism or, extremism or fanaticism or, you know, craziness because it is a form of Islam. And if you don't understand that, you can't combat the ideology. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Anybody else? I would just say I think there's multiple reasons why people are radicalized and so there is no silver bullet. It's not people are poor and if they became business owners and they would not be radicalized and we know that because there have been people who have not been poor who have been radicalized. Uh, we mm -hmm. know that it's not only a lack of democracy and the ability to express yourself and participate in the political system because French and Belgians and Americans are radicalized. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why uh, people are radicalized uh, ranging I think from uh, you know lack of opportunity whether it's political or economic on the one hand but also to uh, adventure tourism and uh, the, the sense mm -hmm. that you can get caught up in a, something that is historic. They're, you know, they're, they're making history right now in a way that seems much more attractive than what one is doing. <laughs> or just in, you're in a, uh, <coughs> a, a group of persuasive people and you, uh, and you start to adopt their ways of uh, thinking. So I, I think it's a very, really, a very complicated um, set of motivations and I don't think that we're really even close to necessarily yeah. understanding them all. Before 
not to mention, you know, actually being able to have a common approach to them. And you might look at the essay by Farah, Farah Pandit because she does address Richard's question. What motivates young people to kill other mm -hmm. people in the name of the black flag of Islam, of the Islamic State? I also would say, just as a comment, to, to support what Richard said, I thought the most interesting and important part of President Obama's speech Sunday night was at the very end. He said two very important things. We can't be governed by fear, and we can't go overboard, especially in castigating Muslims in general. But he also said the Muslim community worldwide has to take responsibility. And they have to have a conversation. And I think for President Obama to put that on the table, um, and given the, you know, the worldwide credibility that he has, I thought it was a very important thing for him to do. Yes, sir. And a mic's coming right to you. Thank you very much. Larry Checo. Um, I'd like to get back to the refugee question um, because you, I think you yourself said, Nick, that there's like 3 million to 5 million outside of Syria. 5 million outside of Syria. 5 million Syria. outside, even worse. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about 10,000, 20,000. I think I added it up and there's less than 100,000 or just over 100,000 people that were these four or five countries that you mentioned were willing to take in. It seems like a Band-Aid on a much larger problem. And uh, just wondering how you feel about that. I mean, are we just doing tokenism here in terms of refugees? Well, the great burden has fallen upon Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Lebanon. Uh, they have taken in huge numbers of refugees, uh, up to a million in almost in each case. And then you have now this exodus across the Aegean Sea, up the spine of the Balkans into Germany. Angela Merkel, uh, you know, she, Germany may tr end up taking 800 to 900,000 people in the next in the, in the 12 month period that began just a few months ago in September. What is our responsibility? And I, this is well documented. We've always taken responsibility to do about half. And the 65,000 number that Hillary Clinton has supported, that, I, that many of us are supporting, comes simply from the first appeal by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for 130,000 places. That number is going to soar. We're stuck uh, down at 1,548. And most of the people who are running for president believe we should slam the door shut. So this is not just token. We can really help a lot of people if we well, open our doors. A couple of comments, too, um, that, that may make this easier. Where these people go, they create, unfortunately, that the size of their, their numbers destabilize the societies they go to. Uh, we're certainly seeing that in the neighbor countries of, of Syria. Yeah. And Merkel, who I think did the moral and courageous thing that just said, bring them on, is now suffering a huge political backlash huge political backlash in Germany, which has taken well over 100,000, I think. I don't know what the number is. So it dwarfs all the rest of us, all the puny <laughs> countries taking puny numbers combined. I mean, good for her, in my view. Um, but what's the end state we're trying to achieve here? Uh, first, stop the bleeding. That's what Haas is talking about with the safe zones. But hopefully some of these people, if, if anything is left after the carpet bombing of Syria by Russia, that uh, seems to me their approach, uh, we hopefully some of them can come back and one more PS uh, Who are these people? I mean these are highly intelligent well-educated people uh, Shorthand Bill Gates is uh, Bill, not Bill Gates Bill uh, Steve Jobs father was a Syrian refugee not in the most high-level job, but look look at his son um, These are enormously bright and in many cases well-educated people think of the Cuban exodus in 1960 and they're going to societies that have low birth rates so this could be, if it's handled right, again, if it's handled right, uh, a huge infusion of new talent and, and vitality into all these economies. Haas. Yeah, just think, and really playing off of Jane's last comments there, um, that the safe zones would allow people to stay local. And the, the demographic activity associated with anybody who is a refugee, it's really down in the 10, 15 percent ever go back. They stay once they go, okay? And particularly in a, in a crisis like this, which we may stop shooting soon, but this is not over soon, right? okay? And so the likelihood, and, and Europe demographically is about the oldest place in the world, okay? Equate that to risk calculus in business, equate that to innovation, et cetera. There, this infusion is gonna be hugely disruptive not just now, but into the future, um, no matter how you look at it. And these people will bring good traits as well as bad. Okay. 
I mean, you're just going to have to deal with this. Uh, and, and it's not politically going to be easy at all. It's a big topic. One final comment. My colleague at the Harvard Kennedy School, Michael Ignatieff, just published an article in New York uh, Review of Books where he makes an additional argument to what Haas and Jane and I have made. He says, strategically, the Islamic State wants to create the impression among Muslims that there's a battle, a war between Islam and the rest of the world. If you start shutting doors to Muslim refugees, it plays into the Islamic State mm -hmm. right. uh, game. I thought that was a compelling point. I just read it this morning on the flight down. I thought it was a compelling point that Michael Ignatieff, <laughs> I want to give him due credit, made. Yes, sir. And we'll, uh, right here in the end of the front row. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, um, and I write the Mitchell Report. And I want to ask a question in the spirit uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Aspen Security Group, which is to say something. Um, it, it, the question may sound pointed. It's not intended to generate pointed responses, but it has to do with the extent to which you have had an opportunity in your discussions to talk about leadership on this issue, and particularly American leadership, and particularly the President. And I just want to preface it by saying that last month I participated in a um, three-day session in Abu Dhabi of people from not just the region, but from Russia and China and, and, and elsewhere. And we, I, I heard two things, and this is both on the stage, from the podium and in the panel sessions, but also at the, the dinner conversations and the breakfast conversations, and they were all negative, uh, significantly negative about us and particularly about the President. And I think that, the, that as, I, uh, as I engaged in conversation with those people and uh, ones that I thought were pretty, pretty reasonable on it, the, the, the most charitable way they would describe it is to say, he confuses us. We don't get exactly where he is. And uh, it may be that that you know, leading from behind thing has, has, uh, is something he can't shake. But I'm just curious to know from, from this group of people how you assess how we are doing, and the we in this case is pretty much a, uh, the, the president, and, and what, Got it. what things you think could be done that would address that issue. Thank you. Who would like to take on this question? <laughs> Richard Fontaine. All right. Um, look, I think uh, with respect to Syria and ISIS and Iraq, I, I think it's clear we made a, a grievous error in withdrawing all American troops from Iraq in 2011. That's something from which we're still reeling now. Um, when it comes to Syria and to Iraq, I think part of the, at least the messaging problem has been uh, the administration saying that given ideas X, Y, and Z are terrible just until the time they do a little bit of it. And so, you know, we couldn't send troops back into Iraq because we didn't have a status of forces agreement, but now we have 3,500 3, there without a status of forces agreement. You know, we couldn't uh, bomb uh, Iraq uh, until we started doing that, or Syria until we started doing that. Training and equipping Syrian rebels was a bad idea until we started doing that. We couldn't deploy special operations forces for a variety of reasons, and we we're doing that both in Iraq and in Syria. And now they're going to take direct action in at least Iraq and possibly in Syria as well. And so this kind of incremental uh, escalation of efforts, uh, I think, comes across as seeming like it's doing just enough to try to keep the worst catastrophe from sort of metastasizing without doing enough to actually deal with the underlying drivers of either the conflict in Syria, the problems in Iraq, or ISIS as in general. And I think that, that has led to uh, some confusion in the region about what it is we are actually doing and whether it's likely to be successful. Well, I, I think it's a good question, and it has to be asked. And uh, I, that is why I think Congress should come back in a special session and debate an, an authorization to use military force. Because in, through that vehicle, the American people will get behind a strategy, not just a set of tactics. And hopefully our country will speak with one voice. I mean, there needs to be an adult in the room. This you know, race to the bottom in our presidential contest is not helping this. But we're not talking about the presidential candidates. We're talking about elected members of Congress who are up for re-election next year and I think have an obligation to provide for the common defense and declare war and ought to be measured by whether they're going to stand up and be, be adults. So uh, these issues are hard. I don't think Obama has made the sale. People don't understand our policy. Uh, and he is, by, by, by nature, very cautious. And he did get elected, pledging to end the wars in Iraq and, and uh, 
uh, and, and Afghanistan. And the circumstances are a little more icky than he anticipated. So um, let, I think Congress should help him out. And I, and I don't think this is about Democrat, Republican. I think this is about America. And our country is vulnerable. And if we speak with one voice, we have the best possible chance of defeating not just an army, which this is, holding territory, but an idea. Just, ah. just one last, um, to elevate this just slightly um, and, and, and protect me from getting into um, the pointed. Um, the, the reality that we have not yet as a nation come to grips with is that the days, the short period of time where we were the, the answer to all problems, mm -hmm. okay, unilateralism, okay, to a world that is really moving to multipolar, multi multilateralism. I mean, leadership is a is almost a dirty word in every poll to our millennials, in in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it is. Legitimacy is is the concept that these people are embracing. Now, does that mean that we should get rid of leadership, that leadership will go away? Absolutely not. But it does mean that the concepts of our place in the world and how we, how we exercise our capabilities in the world are going to have to be put into a context of other equals out there and other representative voices rather than just our way. There are many, many nations out there that are willing to expend our lives and our treasure. Okay. Um, we have to have a voice, and we will always have a voice in that, but we have to come to grips with the reality of the world that we are actually moving towards, which is much more multilateral. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, right Goodness. in the back. You have your, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Uh, a mic's going to come right to you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Molly Razor. I taught for four years at the University of Jordan in Amman, 2009, 10, 11, 2000 to 2013, and I can't tell you the number of times that students would come up to me and say, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you doing humanitarian zones? Why aren't you doing safe zones? What did you do in the Balkans? Mm -hmm. This was a time when the Tatari camps were being, camp was being built, and they were frantic because, is it because we are not a European country? Now I'm getting emails from all my friends in Jordan who are just equally frantic, mainly because the unnamed person is so important. He is having an effect around the world, and certainly in the Muslim world. So my question is, it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda. If we had done something in 2011 or 2012, would we be in a different situation now? So I, sh I was un unable to see the questioner, but it's Ambassador Molly Razor, well. our <laughs> former chief former, protocol. Former. former chief protocol, so thank you for your question. Um, who would like to take that question? To th I think you're referring to that there was, we know now from the books that have been published that there were several leading members of the cabinet <laughs> who wanted a more assertive American response to the Syrian civil war, including arming in a well, consequential yeah, way know, Syrian my, rebel groups. I think one that's. One of my students said that his, her uncle was in charge of one, one of the groups, and they'd be happy to get together if only we would give them some arms. So awesome. Monday morning is always more informed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, coulda, woulda, shoulda, as, as you put it, Ambassador. Um, you know, we could. The the question here again is the symptom versus cure activity that's going on, and, and what exactly would you want to do, and how do you actually find these people, and and and, and beyond anecdotal, quite frankly, and it's very very difficult. Um, and you know, you can come up with arguments on both sides of the fence on this. I think people today believe that if we had been more aggressive earlier, we'd probably, we for sure would be in a different position. Whether it would be advantaged or not, or whether we would be now owning this, um, you know, is kind of the countervailing arguments on, on, on the discussion. And I, I'm not picking one side or the other on this. I just uh, well, I trying to think your way through it. Sure. I mean, I, you know, and, and it's, it's very easy to put that face on it, but that face does not live in isolation. And, and so well, it is a far bigger activity. But when you say there's a red line about Syria using chemical weapons and that you're going to act 
and all the golf leaders think you're going this to act. This is President Obama. We've been to told act. this, and John Kerry thinks we're going to act and announces it, and then we don't. Uh, I think that was, uh, and and many many Democrats as well as Republicans supported that action, including, uh, as you referenced, Molly people who were close advisors in the room at the time, uh, at least as reported by subsequent books. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I think that will be viewed as a, as a serious strategic mistake, and I think it has caused some of the problem. And had we acted with these limited pinpipe, pinprick stripe, the strikes, uh, we would have had the opportunity to degrade Assad's air assets, which might have prevented a lot of the barrel bombs. So I, I think it's very unfortunate, and we would have, should have, could have acted earlier. So um, we have time for a few more questions. One of our panelists has to leave at 1.15. Yeah. Um, that's it's Jane the, it's the holiday party at the Wilson Center, which started at 12. <laughs> and she's I the feel president. sorry for me. I run um, the place, and I really have to get back. But she's I'm, part of the talent show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just invite everybody now. But I'm willing to yeah, take this to, yeah. I'm willing to take this to 1.20 uh, uh, so that Richard and Haas can answer a few more questions. We will okay, close good. at one we We'll try to get as so, many people in. So this is my last. Possibly can. Yes, sir. That I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I um I just wanted to note that when you started the presentation, you mentioned that it's a global problem, it's a regional problem. I grew up near San Bernardino, and it's a local problem. Right. And I wanted to um, also highlight that I went to a, a recent event with my son about uh, social media. And the presenter showed a video, a, a contra video, video to what ISIS is doing. And at the very end, she said, we have to put the de Department of State's logo at the end. And it, to me, it ruined the effect of it. And my question is about the tool set to fight these people. I think you have to have a new set of them. I was wondering if you all had ideas on that level. We do. Um, in fact, if you look at the book that we Gave you, and you walked in, uh, Jared Cohen. Right. Uh, Jared is a young guy who used to work at the State Department uh, for Hillary Clinton, uh, now at uh, Google in a senior position, has thought really hard about how do you wage a battle of ideas on Twitter, Facebook, and social media. So you have an essay by him, Farah Pandit, I've mentioned her before, also focuses on this issue. Jane. Could I just say something about San Bernardino, since I am still a resident of Venice Beach, California, lucky me. Um, the response from the community has been heroic. I mean, this was a grisly, horrible thing by, uh, uh, it sounds like, long radicalized, deadly killers whose baby, probably, as I would think about it, is, was a prop in this whole play to make them seem more local and, and non-controversial. Um, the community has been amazing. The law enforcement responsibility has been careful and thorough, and the FBI has added capacity to that and is doing a great job. But the commentary by people and by this mostly Muslim inter interfaith group called CARE, which apparently had a, uh, a threat to its office this morning here, uh, which turned out to be harmless, but nonetheless has been pitch perfect. So uh, America is resilient. There's no such thing as 100% security. Everybody better get it through your head. You can be hit by a bus walking out the door or fall over. That would be me falling over. Uh, uh, or Molly. Let's, <laughs> let's uh, you know, socialize this problem. Uh, but but um, you can be hit by a bus or fall over. Uh, but uh, what we have to understand is terrorism is intended to terrorize with the right leadership, and I don't think that's a dirty word, if we're uh, both uh, told the, the, the positive stories and, and adequately prepared, uh, we, we, we have a leg up. And, and this country's much safer than the 24-7 news leads you to believe. And I'm now going to a holiday party, so thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Jane. <laughs> so we have time for... Um, we have time for two more <laughs> questions, but Hoss, you wanted to just say? Just real quick, uh, the, Jared has an article in here, but just to kind of give you a context on it. One, um, the, the power of social media in the world that we live in today. For most of us, it is just maybe more often we see the news or, or we have a Facebook account or, or whatever it is. I mean, it's far different for 
both our millennials and the rest of the world as to how important that is and how representative of the belief of the world is. Not necessarily the reality of it, but the belief of it. And, and Jared, uh, in the conversations, ha had a pretty good analogy. Um, it's, it's reaching way back, but the last time that we had something this powerful um, was two inventions. One was done by, believed to be done by the Greeks, which was the invention of the digit zero, which allowed anybody to do math. And the second one was the printing press. Okay? It, it allowed to spread ideas way beyond the boundaries of everything we've ever done, the Gutenberg story. Today, it's computational power and the internet and the ability to take ideas and put them out there far more powerfully than we ever did in the past, not necessarily requiring fact. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's the reality. It's the reality our children are living in and growing up in. And so it is a very powerful activity. And you remember, I mean, at the end of the printing press activity was the Reformation, Hundred Year Wars, the end of feudalism. I mean, all of these things were very disruptive activities. We should not believe that we're not in for some very disruptive activity as a result of much of this social media activity. And on this line, read a very interesting op-ed by Ann Applebaum in yeah. this morning's Washington Post on this very subject. Yes, we have a question right here by this woman, woman in the second row. Yeah. My name is Dorothy McGee, and I am a non-professional military and foreign policy person. And so asking as a layperson, going back to the subject the general seemed to rather artfully want to evade, the question of the safe zones. Many of us are extremely concerned about the degree to which the creation of a safe zone would precipitate a military confrontation with Russia. We see what they're doing on the Turkish border. Um, a, current intelligence. What are they indicating about the Russian thinking on the creation of such zones? And B, what are they thinking in terms of the degree to which Russia would use those zones as a way to play military cat and mouse with the U.S.? Sure. I, I, it's a fair question, and you should always go to the countervailing in any strategy before you proceed on, which is why I'm saying it's going to take us some time. And Jane certainly had, had concerns in those areas. But you know, I, don't, I don't want to get too military-ish here, but I mean, there's nothing they're doing there that we can't counter. Okay? I mean, we're not seeing the invention of a whole new kind of war. Or anything. I mean, that's, so if we decide as a part of the coalition that we're going to, in an area, start a safe zone and create a safe place, one, we're not going to do that in isolation without letting the Russians know this is exactly what we're going to do. And we are going to do this. This is not a choice. If you want to be a dissenter, that's fine but we're going to exercise our prerogative here and that's what we're going to do. There should be no fear that that starts a war with Russia. Russia would be crazy to go into that kind of a conflict, okay, in conference. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean that's all, almost too, you know, in your face, but please, you know, this, do not believe that the choice should be eliminated because Russia doesn't agree. That should not be a worry. That should be something that is in our calculus about how we approach them on the issue but it should not be deterred from if the larger group decides we need safe zones and here's why we need them. It may determine where the first one is. You know. but I, now, that's my opinion. That's purely my opinion on this. Um, but you know, I, I, just, I, I would worry that you know, our calculus is, oh my gosh, you know, we might have two you know, American airplane and a Russian airplane you know, run into each other and, and out of the ambiguity shoot at each other. Okay. This is war. <coughs> so I, 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 I dismiss that to some extent as being a reason to not move forward on something that is so clearly aligned with our, our ultimate objectives. And there's a vehicle for it. And that's the <coughs> diplomatic track that Secretary yeah. Kerry started. Because one of the primary obligations of the diplomats is help the refugees and help the internally displaced, as they're called, by the United Nations. So that's where I think where you cite the Russians on this. You argue for it. You give them an opportunity to help us. And if they yeah. won't, you go ahead and do it. I think Jim and I had a brief conversation before yeah. this. It, make, it, does, it should be considered. It should be one of the options that the administration now looks at. We have a final question right here. Thank you. 
Fin Finley Lewis of Congressional Quarterly. Uh, this is a very narrow question. Uh, assuming that the administration had decided to leave a residual force in Iraq rather than pulling everybody out, how would that have made a difference? So we end by looking back. Uh, Jim, you were just leaving, I guess, right, when this happened. I'm um, now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you were just leaving then. You know, you could woulda, shoulda uh, on this. Um, I think most, most people would say if we were able to have left a residual force there, that would have been some stability. Would it have encouraged more bad acting on the part of, of, of forming government? Would it have given opportunity to form a better and more cohesive government and nation and given it the stability, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Germany and Japan and things like that? Um, you know, there are a lot of arguments pro and con. I would have been <coughs> certainly for leaving the residual force, but I was not willing to support that in the absence of, of a set of laws that protected the American soldiers in that country, and they were unwilling to grant that. Well, I mean, everybody goes back on any negotiation and says, well, if I didn't negotiate it, it would have worked out. We ended up where we ended up, and without that capability, without that assurance of the protection for those individuals on the ground, I certainly, as a military commander, could not recommend staying there under those conditions. And this is just where we know protection for American forces. They weren't liable for criminal prosecution. And the fact is, I, w I was an outsider. The Iraqi government did not give us that agreement uh, by the end. Know. Richard. Well, they didn't give us that agreement in the form that we wanted. Right. They would do it as an executive agreement, not as an agreement passed by the parliament, and we still have not obtained that, but yet we have 3,500 American troops in Iraq in the absence of that agreement. So if it was a bad idea then, and it's a good idea now, something has changed, other <laughs> than the willingness of the government in Baghdad to negotiate. The other thing that I would just add to that, though, is apart from the military stabilization effort, Iraq is, was and remains a very immature political system that is susceptible to external influence. It was the American external influence, among others, but the withdrawal of American troops ensured that there would be almost no American uh, political leverage or influence over the government, and that that would be filled by Iran. So it is not a coincidence that within 24 hours of the last American troop leaving Iraq, Prime Minister Maliki issued an arrest warrant for his Sunni Vice President Tariq al-Hashmi, who then had to flee to, uh, to Iraqi Kurdistan in order to not go to jail or, or, or face worse. And that began the unraveling of, through the misrule of Maliki, who decided he wanted to be the prime minister of the Shia rather than the prime minister of Iraq. Uh, had we had a presence there, could we have exerted more influence over him in some of that decision making than we did in the absence of those? Probably, I think so. Well, we're going to bring this to an end. I want to thank the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation for sponsoring this Washington Roundtable. <laughs> Richard, Haas, Jane, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Brent? Great job.